Hey, seventh grade, how are we doing today, guys? We are going to be talking about the world's population today and kind of population growth rates and stuff like that because it is related to the fifth theme of geography movement and the movement of people. And of course, what we've been talking about lately, which is human environmental interaction. All right, so let's take a look at what's going on population wise globally. So when we look at this, Oh, for some reason it did that stop share again. So when we look at this though, uh, what we're looking at is how many people live on earth. And currently we have over 7 billion people. Uh, estimates are we're around 7.7, 7.8 billion. And it is estimated we will be getting to 8 billion people soon, uh, as soon as 2024. Uh, and it's somewhere between 2024, 2030, dependent on our population growth rates. So we're going to talk a little bit about those today. All right. Uh, when we look at population growth rates, let me get this going here. Um, you want to look at population and we measure population growth by two ways. There's two ways that we do this. The first is the death rate. Now I'm sound kind of morbid, but what that is, is how many people die for every thousand, uh, you know, how many people actually out of a thousand die in a year. And you might have a hundred or 150, or you might have 12. It just depends on what is going on in that country. But the idea is, is how many people die out of every thousand who, uh, you know, over the course of a year. And then the second is an increase in the world's birth rate. And that's how many kids are born for every thousand people. So again, you look at the number of a thousand, maybe there's 200 kids born, maybe there's 300 kids born. It just depends on what that growth rate is. The death rate has actually been decreasing over the last 40 years because healthcare's gotten better, diets have gotten better, food's gotten better, um, and so people are living longer. So we're actually seeing a decrease in the death rate, and we've actually seen an increase in the world's birth rate because in other parts of the world, traditionally in the United States, uh, our you know families typically have two, and like it's a weird number, it's like 2.3 kids. But in other places, the average might be five or six kids. So you're looking at uh, cultural um, kind of things going on with that as well. All right. So it just kind of depends. But again, you're seeing a decrease in the birth rate and an increase in the death rate. And that's really uh, how you're seeing population growth as opposed to a decline in the population. There's two types of population growth that we're going to talk about today. There's the J curve and then there's the S curve. And so I want you to sit back and ask, what do you think sounds like the better growth rate. Two types, J curve and S curve. And we're going to talk about both of them today, okay? I want you to think about it. So the two types of population growth rate that exist, sorry, let me move that out of the way. Uh, the two types of population growth rate, we're going to start off just talking about, come on, uh, the J curve. And J curve is a rapid type of growth rate. Okay, this means the population is growing really fast. Now, depending on who you are, you might say, hey, that's really good or that's not. But the problem with the J curve is that the population growth exceeds the food supply. And that's not something you want to have. If you exceeded the food supply, that means you have more people than food. What do you think that's going to lead to? I'll tell you this, it ain't good. Uh, it's called starvation. So the S curve is the growth rate that you want to have. This is rhythmic, but it has typically a small population burst. But it, the big thing, it doesn't exceed the food supply. And that's important. In other words, you always have enough food. All right. Kind of looks like a big OS. So let's take a look at what's going on with the world's population growth rate right now. So here we are. Uh, this is from the United Nations. Um, it said we were a little over 7 billion. We're kind of on our way to 8 billion up here. But what kind of growth rate does that look like? The good news is, is if you see the J, that's what that is. That's a J curve. So if you're ever wondering why there's other parts of the world that are going hungry and stuff, there are areas that have the population has exceeded the food supply. That is the issue um, and why we have, you know, global stuff like that. So here's the world's population right now. China roughly makes up almost 20%, India uh, almost 18%, and here's us, 4.39%. If you don't know what that, uh, the 20 point, uh, here, here's our 7.8 billion. Uh, China is around 1.4 billion. India is closing in fast at 1.3 billion. We're down here, 331 million, but 
Fun fact, we're the third most populated country on the planet. So it's not like we're just some tiny, tiny country. We have a large stake in this. But if you think about it, out of that 7 billion people, 3 billion roughly live in China or India, just in those two countries. That's massive, all right? So advances in technology, such as improved irrigation systems, the creation of better plants, sturdier plants, stuff that's you know insect resistance, all of that increased fruit production has also increased population. But when you see warfare, when you see drought or famine, um, a severe lack of food, then you're starting to see populations uh, you know, that's where you start to see people go hungry and whatnot. Here's the expected population growth uh, that they, they, they did from the National Population Research Center. Africa's population is ex expected to increase 120%. The United States' population is exp expected to decrease about 50%. China, or, uh, Europe and Russia's is expected to decrease. Uh, they have what we call a graying population. What that means is the average age of people is going up because, frankly, the average uh, family in uh, Europe has like one kid per family, 1.8 kids or something. It's less than two. And if you have two, uh, that means you have zero population growth rate because you have, you know, two people and then they have a kid. If they have two kids, that's, you know, they'll eventually die and the net gain is zero. But if you have three kids or four kids, then the net gain becomes net one, net two, stuff like that. Remember, land only covers roughly 30% of the Earth's surface. And so half of that is really usable in what we call arable land that's be able to use by humans. Uh, mountains, deserts, ice, you can't farm on that stuff. And so it's hard to support large numbers of people in that. So the, the usable land is not evenly distributed. Uh, we are fortunate enough to, to live in a very fertile uh, area. We live in the Midwest of the United States. You got corn literally growing you know, 500 feet from us. There's food all over the place. Um, but it's not like that. You know, you go to the Sahara Desert or you go to certain parts of the world, um, it's either too cold, they can't farm. You go to Russia, Alaska, you go to uh, the Sahara, Northern Africa, um, you know, Atacama Desert, you can't farm in those types of things. People naturally prefer to live in places that have fertile soils because so they can farm and have food. They like milder climates. The, like we, and that's why we have a large population around our area. There's natural uh, resources, water resources. Again, this is related to the theme of movement and people move to these areas for those things. These are big, this is, this is all this. Two thirds of the world's people are clustered into five regions. And these are gonna be how we study this geography going in through the rest of the year. We're gonna look at East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Europe, Eastern North America. They're really the large population centers. Literally, there's no human, permanent human population in Antarctica, like none, all right? So, you know, it's just penguins and ice. So, you know, cause it's just uninhabitable. Most regions, most people live by cities. Most people have an urban population uh, because rural areas, you know, don't have a lot of jobs. And so they, people move, again, there's that theme of movement. They move to cities looking for a job. They're looking for opportunities. Uh, geographers try to find out how populated or how crowded a country is by measuring what we call population density. We're gonna look at some population density maps later. And, um, you know, look, we, th what that is is the average number of people that live within a square mile or square kilometer. All you have to do, here's for all you math people, is calculate it by taking the total population by dividing by the total land area, all right? That's easy. But what it doesn't do is it, it might tell you how many people live per square mile, but remember, not every square mile is flat and the same. So something to keep in mind. Moving from place to place is the same. Uh, we call that internal migration. So like, let's say you're moving here in the United States, you're leaving Illinois and you're moving to Missouri. Um, that's internal migration. You're not really going anywhere. An example of this, like I said, you go from a farmer village, you go to the city. So there's some folks that might be coming from a small town. I don't know. There's a little town called Salem, Illinois, like 60 miles east of here. Maybe they move toward Belleville or Shiloh or St. Louis because we have more jobs. There's more opportunities. An example of people going that, that that's something, you know, they go to the former farmer village, you go to the city, they're looking for jobs. That leads to what we call urbanization. And you guys are watching this actually happen with Shiloh. 
Shiloh, when I first started working here about 20 years ago, only had about a thousand people, 800, a thousand people living it. Now Shiloh has almost 15,000 people living it. That's called urbanization. And that is the growth of the city. Um, urbanization has occurred and it's happening very rapidly in Asia, Africa, uh, and Latin America. You're starting to see ur places urbanize very, very quickly. Cities are booming uh, because people are moving from those rural areas, coming to the cities and looking for those opportunities. Movement between countries is called international migration. And so that's when you have folks come from another country and moving to a country like say somebody moved from uh, France or Britain to the United States, that would be international migration. They will emigrate, they're gonna leave their home country behind, they were born there and they're moving here to start a new life. Um, we call these individuals immigrants, but what we call the movement, the movement is known as emigrating. And I want you to know that difference. All right, you may have emigrated here. If I'm asking you for the movement, you've emigrated here from Italy. You've emigrated here from Nigeria. You've emigrated here from China. Okay, if you move from the United States to say Britain, you're emigrating. And then when you live there, you are an immigrant. All right, the immigrant mean, means to the, refers to the person. Emigrate refers to the movement. Emigrates the movement, Immigrants, the person. I want you to understand that. Immigration has increased greatly over the last 200 years, partially due to, you know, better transportation. You have what are called push factors. Push factors are factors such as a shortage of farmland, not enough food, you're looking for jobs, you know, those types of things. And that might force people to move people. Then there's pull factors. Um, you know, the pull factors say, hey, I can get a job there. The, you have a lot of immigrants wanting to come to the United States because we have jobs and stuff like that. You might have a push factor like a natural disaster. Uh, people, you know, have to move because a hurricane came or maybe a war started and they're trying to reach safety. There's different push and pull factors that exist, whether they're geographic, uh, economic, or social, things like that. There's all sorts of different push and pull factors. People who are forced to flee from other countries are called refugees. Here is another uh, thing. This is from the World Population Data Sheet. Uh, this, this basically gives you an idea of what's going on and where people are moving to. As you can see, the United States, we're around 13.5% of the population are from other countries. Okay, um, We're pretty popular as far as immigration goes. We're not as popular as Australia, though. A lot of people, 15% well, of the population in Australia comes from other countries. Um, not a lot of people move into South America, not a lot of people move into Africa or you know, India, China. Um, more people are going into Europe, but here's number one, here's number two, and here's number three. You're looking at that total population of people moving into those areas, okay? And uh, again, you might have had a war that's taking place in Africa. Those people might move to Europe. Uh, you might have had something down here. Uh, they might be moving up here. Uh, again, opportunity, push and pull factors are affecting that. So we will, oh, we will um, keep that going on, sorry. So we will uh, stop on that one. Uh, we are gonna talk a little bit more about the push-pull factors. You will have some assignments that deal with push-pull factors this week. All right, I will see you at the Zoom. Have a good one, guys. Bye-bye.